I just posted something on my Facebook page. My guitar player, my band back east, said um, he posted a, a link from the Daily Current, which if you've never read the Daily Current, is essentially like the Onion. If you've ever read the Onion, it's a great satire site. It's a fantastic satire site, actually. The Daily Current is, I think, slightly less less clever. It's the same idea. And they posted uh, uh, something about Sarah Palin. And my guitar player jumped on it and said, I can't believe she said this. And I sent him a real quick PM. I'm like, I'm like dude, she didn't. It was a daily current. Like, it was, it was, it's a joke. Um, and if he had read down, he would have realized that it was a joke. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know. The problem was everybody jumped on him then. Hey, it's satire, man. What should I read? What should I read? Then, like, how easy, it, our lives are so busy. How easy is it to just fall into that headline reading <laughs> trap, you know? It's so easy to miss the most obvious stuff by just reading the headline and maybe get an incomplete picture of what's actually going on. So, and then somebody else posted something called Pose Law, which I just found out. Very interesting. It was posed in 2005. And I gotta Google it because I can't remember how to say it. The phrasing of it was that one, one of the Facebook comments was, well, it's not that hard to believe she would have said something like that. And I was like, oh, that's a little harsh. But it turns out that there's actually a, a law, and it's a law, not a provable mathematical entity, that says. An internet adage reflecting the idea that without a clear indication of the author's intent, it is difficult or impossible to tell the difference between an expression of sincere extremism and a parody of extremism. Which means if you if somebody says, Sarah, check out what Sarah Palin said this, this week, and it was a joke, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between it being a joke and it being something she actually said because she is so well known for making those kinds of mistakes that as soon as you hear a parody of her, it seems real. For the same reason, you can pretty much count on Sean Hannity to get pissed off at a progressive or a liberal. Just because he always does. Right. So if somebody parodied him doing it, it, you might not even think twice about its about its, gen, about its, its, its genuine nature because he does it all the time. Does that, does that make sense? Or me, for example, going like this. Somebody making fun of me or, or saying, did you believe what Sean did in class today? It was like, it's every other day. You know, it's just like well, that's what that's what they, I, I find that interesting that it, it's actually the internet has spawned these kinds of ideas of of I, don't know, just, I just find it interesting. There's so much so much stuff floating around and what settles down and what what, help, what hooks in and what doesn't. So anyway, well, I told you that today. And I the, came out of something. I and the medium is. helps, you know, like with the um, I think of the town now with the Ferguson. Ferguson, you know, I mean. I, the media jumped on certain oh God, yeah. things, and then everybody sure. reacts by what they think they know. It's interesting. I don't know if you guys are Colbert Report fans or not, Stephen Colbert fans, but he does a really interesting job of time stamping media re re reporting of things. Uh, it's all it's all facetious, of course. He's like the Daily Current mm -hmm. in a suit, uh, which I, which I love. But he'll often he'll, his point is that the media says the same thing. All media outlets say the same thing. And to prove that point, what he'll do is he'll say something that sounds ridiculous. Like he'll say something that sounds like an overly ridiculous thing to say, and then he'll have a series of 12 news clips of the anchors all saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the reason he's saying it, of course, is when you see it like that, it then becomes, well, this liberal and this liberal and this liberal, and it's boom, boom, and they're all saying the exact same thing. All the major news outlets pull their news from the same wire, and they're fed things to say. And, you, and what's interesting is when they deviate too far from it, how much trouble they get in sometimes. Do you, have you ever seen the one, and I forget the dude's name, the entertainment reporter for Fox News was interviewing Samuel L. Jackson. This is going back about a year and a half, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, maybe even last year, I forget which. And um, the entertainment reporter had a script, and he was reading off the script. He's like, so how's that Super Bowl commercial treating you? And Samuel L. Jackson goes, what Super Bowl commercial? You think I'm Lawrence Fishburne. And then... And then he rips him for three straight minutes about, I'm the other guy. <laughs> I'm not Lawrence Fishburne, I'm the other guy. I'm the what's in your wallet guy. And just rips the guy. I think people are afraid of that, of making those kinds of mistakes, so they stick to those scripts. But the problem with sticking to those scripts, of course, is the fact that then everybody's saying the same thing. And then you get these discussions about which is more liberal, which is more conservative, which is more progressive. It doesn't matter. They're all saying the same thing anyway. Same thing anyway. Everybody's <laughs> saying the same thing. So pick whatever one you like. If you like a certain anchor, watch that person talk. Because they're saying the same thing as the next person over in the next the next news, or better yet, read a nice subjective news site that doesn't have a, tele a, a televised prompt and make your own decisions, which is kind of why you're here to some degree. I had a chuckle the other day. I was listening to the radio, and there was this ad for some sort of program or medication, something for diabetics. Oh yes. And it says, um, 
reminding you that two-thirds of diabetics live in the city. We're looking to change the statistics. <laughs> Sorry. Reminding you that two-thirds of diabetics live in the city. Yeah, so I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah, two-thirds of people live in cities. That's pretty believable, I would imagine. So I would imagine like that even more than two-thirds of people live in cities. Their slogan was like, we're looking to change, change the statistics. Change the statistics. That's so, so cute. I thought that was cute, yes. What was their point by saying two-thirds live in the city? Do you have any idea? What was it tied to? Oh, it was. I think it was some sort of research that was dedicated oh, to diabetes. But I... That's interesting. I wonder if the diabetic rate is actually lower in cities. Because two-thirds diabetics live in cities. What percent of Americans do you think live in major metro areas? Well, is it more than two thirds? Do you think it's more than two thirds? <coughs> diabetes is uh, also <coughs> ethnic. Like is it? Are, oh, I didn't realize that there are different genetic markers for ethnicity. Like heart disease, same thing. Right. It's higher in the African American population than it is the okay, Caucasian population. It is. I didn't think diabetes was like that. See, I have a skewed version of a skewed view of diabetes. My mom used to tell me I get diabetes walking around barefoot all the time. Oh, Her funny. uncle way of scaring me into not being happy. Yeah, <laughs> didn't work obviously. <laughs> when you get diabetes, but that's interesting. I did not know it was ethnically tied to. I wonder. So this is one of those things. I wonder about a statement like that. Like I wonder if they're trying to. I don't know. I want, do you have any idea what percentage of Americans live in urban areas? We can Google it. We'll take some time later to do that. Maybe. I think it's more than two-thirds? Less? Just about two-thirds? I'm envisioning more. I'm, I'm envisioning electoral maps right now in my mind. How the big major urban areas generally are blue for the elections and the more rural areas are red. Yeah. And then we, used, we looked at that one map early on in the class where it was distorted for population. And the urban areas are so heavily populated with voting people, which would also probably correlate to all people, not just voting people. So I wonder if they say two thirds of all diabetics live in the city. I wonder if that would actually imply that diabetes rate is lower in cities than rural. Eighty point seven percent of Americans live in urban areas. Eighty point seven, more than two thirds. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it, Dana man. So that's actually higher than two thirds. So I bet you, I would almost bet that the rate of diabetes is lower in urban centers than it is in rural areas. Which is like exactly the opposite. The opposite of what I'm thinking. This is trying. Thank you for bringing this up. This is so much fun. <laughs> this is great because then we can use we can turn this into a quiz for next term. Oh good. No, this is great. <laughs> this is fantastic because it. I would love to know what the intent of saying that is. I don't remember. So this is so quick. Thank you. Of course. Any time. So, 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 so to remember, and it was actually like that. Remember that. Yeah, this is so good. rule. I love this. I love when you guys find it. It's even better. Remember, two thirds of diabetes sufferers, is that correct? Yeah. Like live that. in cities. All right, we're, we're going to run a check that. I just type cooties. cooties. Cities. There we go. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me when I said sufferers. Uh, if, if four out of five people suffer from diarrhea, does that mean one out of five enjoys it? <laughs> That's one of my favorite ones I ever read. <laughs> one of my favorite ones I read. Share that with Lightheart and it. <laughs> so today in 244, not to say this is important, we were measuring different braking distances of bike brakes. I was telling the kids a story about how I bought a cyclocross bike uh, two years ago which is a great commuting bike, fantastic commuting bike. It's way better than a mountain bike. You get going a lot faster, but it's also stable enough to ride off roads. But it came with these things called cantilever brakes. The cantilever brakes are kind of old school. Like if you look, buy a mountain bike from the mid to late to early, mid to late 70s or early 80s, they had these things called cantilever mountain bike brakes, which you've probably seen them years ago on an older bike. They've been upgraded to V-brakes and then to disc brakes. And, and what I designed was I designed a test to see which kind was best. I, I recruited the help of my son to help me take measurements of braking distances on the same bike with different brakes. And the reason I'm bringing this up is the test all hinged upon being able to take my sample and make it, how many of you have heard like, oh, you've got those brakes, those are awesome. Or, hey, you've got that blank, that's awesome. Hey, you like that, that's awesome. That mm -hmm. helps me do this. Where do those statements come from? When that person says that, why are they saying that? Their experience, beautiful. That's anecdote, right? That's anecdote. Like I've told people, I go to acupuncture. They say, you're a statistician, how can you do that? I say, because I do and because it works. And they come back and they say, but scientific research can't support it. At this point, both of us are telling the truth because scientific research has never supported that acupuncture actually does anything, but it works for me. So we're both right. You see what I'm, see what I'm getting at here? Mm -hmm. Anecdote can't be measured except by the person. Mm -hmm. That's it. 
right? When I say acupuncture is the only thing that makes my allergies go away, I'm not lying to you because it is the only thing that makes my allergies go away. I've tried allergy shots. The, the reaction to that was worse than any allergy attack I've ever had. I've tried getting rid of cats. doesn't work. I'm allergic to everything else. They did one of those prick tests on my back years ago. I looked like a Christmas tree. I actually heard them say that. I have the Christmas tree on his back. I'm allergic to everything except plantains, whatever the hell that is. So basically, nothing was working. And my wife said, you might want to try acupuncture. I'm like, for allergies? Yeah, try it. So I went to allergies, I got the, got the, got the, or went to acupuncture, got the pins all over, pin in the head, you know, whole deal. Stood up, my head just drained when I sat up. Acupuncture's, I'm so sorry. I'm like, I'm not. This is great. I got it all over me. It's not in me anymore. <laughs> but statistics, <laughs> I'm sorry. But statistics shows that acupuncture doesn't do anything, but it works for me. What is good for the individual isn't necessarily good for the population. So, why do we do statistical studies then? Why do we do it? Like, for example, acupuncture works for me, but statistics can't show it works in the general population. Why do we bother testing in the general population? What are we after? If it works for me, isn't that good enough? If it works for me, isn't that good enough? Will it work? Say that again. Will it work for the average person or the majority in this case? So you're both right again. <laughs> You're both right in this case. What we're moving towards now at the end of this course, and we're, we're, all, we're basically there, is being able to view a population as this. Now, here is the average of your population. This is a $10 bill, of course, but this is the same idea we're looking at today. Here's the average of your population. Here's effectiveness of acupuncture. Now, unfortunately, the studies have shown there is no effect. It's at zero. Where do I live on this curve? I live way the hell over here. I would be considered an outlier on that curve, anecdotally. Anecdotally, from my own experience. But we can't show that it's supportive for the general population. <coughs> that's not bad. That's not bad. If it works for me, that's fine for me. And if it works for anybody else, if anybody's going to acupuncture and works for you, then you do it too. But the idea is a statistical study enables us to be able to look at an entire population and make measurements on an entire population in that respect view the, through the lens of a, of a sample. And that's what we're in the middle of right now, being able to make a claim with some kind of validity and accuracy based on the measure of a sample. Fair enough? Now, last time we were together, I think we got to about here, then we, then we called it a day. I want to start talking about this curve today, the actual mathematics behind this curve. And, and that's probably all we're going to get to today is the mathematics. I don't think we'll get much further than that today. And that's okay if we don't. I don't, I don't mind. We can always pick it up next week when I can live with that. But I want to take a, a step back before we go forward and talk about where